Well, good day to everybody. Uh, we are here once again for Daily Devotions, and today uh, is January 11th, and we're on Session 11 and Genesis 32 through 34. So, a uh, way a reminder, uh, uh, Jacob leaves his father-in-law Laban after 20 years uh, of servitude and settles and heads back toward the land of his uh, father and grandfather toward the land of Canaan. And um, as he is approaching uh, the land of Canaan, we're told uh, chapter 32, it's, it's uh, interesting uh, that Jacob went on his way with uh, the angels of God met him. So uh, Jacob has this uh, scene, this, this theopony, uh, this revelation of angels again. And uh, so he uh, says, this is God's camp, and it's just a reminder to him that God is with him. And that's where chapter 32 starts. Really, that should be the end of chapter 31. Chapter 32, uh, verse 2 begins a new narrative. So when we get into chapter 32, 2, what happens is, is that now Jacob is approaching the land of Canaan, his homeland. He knows that uh, after 20 years, he's going to have to encounter his brother Esau, <clears throat> who 20 years earlier, when Jacob had fled uh, Esau, because uh, Esau wanted to kill him for uh, not only uh, uh, finagling him out of his uh, birthright, but also stealing the blessing of the firstborn that his father Jacob was going to give him uh, on his his father Isaac, I'm sorry, was going to give him on his deathbed. So uh, Jacob makes the assumption that Esau is still angry with him and is still out to get him. And so he prepares uh, to uh, offer Esau gifts uh, as a way of penance, I suppose. Uh, so he's, he's a practical man. Jacob is practical enough that uh, he thinks, you know, if I divide uh, my flirts, birds and my flocks and, and the people, my servants into two groups, then if one group is attacked, maybe the other group will survive. So uh, he, he, as he approaches, he divides uh, in his company into two. And then we get in verse nine. It's interesting. Jacob prays to God. And I want you, I want to read this prayer. Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, uh, O Lord who is with me, return to your country and to your kindred, and I will do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all the steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant, for with only my staff I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, please, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau for I am afraid of him. He may come and kill us all, the mothers with the children. Yet you have said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted because of their number. Now, what is interesting is how this prayer begins. I'm not worthy of the least of all, the steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. Notice in 20 years how Jacob has changed. 20 years as he was fleeing from Esau to head toward Laban. Uh, he has the vision of the ladder, the staircase uh, from heaven going up and down and angels going up and down. And God is revealed to him there. And Jacob says after this, this theophany as it's called, this revelation of the divine, he basically says, you know, if God does all this stuff for me, then I'll be, I'll be his servant. I'll be faithful. He'll be my God if God does all this stuff for me. The transactional nature of how Jacob is viewing this. Here we are now 20 years later, and we see a Jacob who has grown up, a Jacob who has matured, uh, a Jacob who has uh, developed a relationship with God that is different. This is not transactional. This is God. I don't deserve your blessings. I don't deserve what's been given to me. 
Uh, and so this is this is a, a, a Jacob who matures, as as I said uh, when we we talked about the story of Jacob in the in the, in the stairway to heaven, uh, the, the the ladder to heaven. That that uh, God's still God worked with Jacob where he was, even though God didn't want to leave him where he was. And so now here is Jacob, who has become more mature and is more faithful. Uh, because God and God has been with him, and so again, that's good news for us that God works with us where we are, not where God wants us to be. He hopes to bring. He hopes that we are brought to the place where we are, uh, what He wants us to be. But, but God doesn't. Uh, God doesn't abandon us if we're if we're not in a sense up to snuff, and that's good news. So Jacob offers this prayer. He spends the night there, and. He decides uh, that he's going to offer Esau a gift, a present, a, a gift of reconciliation. And it is a generous gift. It amounts to, after you count them all, it amounts to about 500 animals. This is huge. Uh, this is an extremely generous gift. And he wants these gifts to pass on ahead of him, these animals in waves, if you will, uh, behind him. Uh, we could, if we wanted, say that there is uh, some cynicism here uh, on the part of Jacob, that he wants to be at the back to protect himself in case there's a problem. And I guess we can't rule that out. But I think also maybe part of this is Esau has no reason to take out any uh, hostilities on the animals or on uh, uh, Jacob's servants or even on his family members. So he puts them first, and when Jacob uh, uh, and and Es and so so basically when Jacob and Esau finally approach, because you can see, imagine all these waves of animals and people coming into the presence of Esau as as Esau uh, ventures toward uh, Jacob. Now, uh, real quick, just to note, starting in verse twenty-two of chapter 32, uh, we get a little interlude in a sense of Jacob wrestling with the angel. And I'm going to come back to that, but I want to just continue this story. I want to skip ahead to verse, chapter 33, where they finally meet. So after Esau encountering these waves of animals and people from Jacob's camp, uh, Jacob looks up and he sees finally Esau is coming, uh, 400 and 400 men with him, a small army. Well, this 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 has got to be a little bit disconcerting, um, and so again he divides up his children. He divides up uh, Leah and Rachel. He puts them in two separate groups. Um, this time Jacob goes ahead of them, and as he is going ahead, he bows down. He's continually bowing down like seven times, uh, and this is this is humbling oneself in a very stark way before before one's brother. Uh, and so Esau sees him, he runs to meet him, and, and there are no hostilities at all. Esau embraces Jacob, uh, fell on his neck, we're told, kiss, kisses him, and together they weep. So this is a reunion. This is reconciliation. And so Esau wants to know who all these animals are and all these people, and Jacob, of course, uh, says this is these all belong to me. Jacob has become quite the man uh, of wealth, and he wants to find favor with his brothers, so he offers him all these animals. And it's interesting; uh, he he offers them as he uses the word a blessing. I offer them as a blessing to you. This is the same word used for Isaac's blessing of Esau that Jacob had stolen. So 20 years before, Jacob had stolen a blessing that Esau, that should have been Esau's, but now what Jacob is doing is offering this very generous blessing to Esau, uh, perhaps for appeasement, uh, but also as uh, perhaps penance, perhaps a way of trying to uh, rest, uh, give restitution for what he had done some 20 years before. Esau does not want the gift. He says it doesn't matter. Uh, and one of the interesting things that Jacob says 
to Esau is uh, to see your face is to see the face of God. Hang on to that. We're coming back to that. See your face is to see the face of God. So he urges Esau to take this generous gift of 500 uh, animals, and Esau finally does accept it. Esau wants to journey on the way, and he wants to, Jacob to come and settle with him. Uh, Jacob uh, seems to know better, and so he settles in a different place, some distance from Esau, in Canaan still, but some distance from Esau. And I wonder sometimes if, if this isn't a lesson for us in reference to reconciliation. The gospel is about reconciliation. I'm going to get more into that in just a minute. But the gospel is about reconciliation. It's about God working throughout history to bring us to God, to put us in right relationship with God, and also to reconcile uh, ourselves, each of us, to one another. And so God is in the reconciliation business. And here Jacob and Esau are finally, after 20 years, reconciled. And that is such good news. And yet Jacob knows that maybe perhaps uh, while things have been reconciled, that it's probably still a good thing if maybe Jacob and Esau do not interact with each other on a daily basis. You know, sometimes the work of reconciliation is hard. It's very difficult, and and uh, in some circumstances, and, and sometimes we all know that you know maybe after several years we reconcile with that family member, or we reconcile with that neighbor, but we know that just because of the nature of the relationship for that reconciliation to remain reconciliation, that maybe it's best we just not see each other a lot. That there's just too many. There's too, much, uh, too many complications. There's all kinds of dynamics going on. And, and that so maybe uh, we, have by, we let bygones be bygones, but maybe that doesn't mean we can live together in such a way as if nothing has ever happened because there's a history. It's a reminder to us that even in the midst of reconciliation in this life, we still live in a broken world and a broken context. And so reconciliation is important and it's good. It doesn't necessarily uh, make things like they were completely before the divide happened. So there's some wisdom here, I think, with Jacob saying, "No, let's not, let's not, let's not live together. Let's uh, let's be near each other, but let's have our space, if you will." So Jacob settles in a different place. Now, I want to go back to wrestling with the angel in contact with that, in, 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 in connection with what I just said. So Jacob, that night before he wrecked CZ saw, uh, he uh, uh, has, a, has, a, has a, a dream, a wrestling match, an encounter, if you will. He's left alone, we're told in verse 24, uh, and he wrestles with this man who's it's identified as a man until daybreak. And uh, this is an all-night wrestling match, and the man is unable to prevail against Jacob. He's unable to win the wrestling match. And so at that point, then, uh, the man strikes Jacob at the hip socket so that his hip is out of joint. And so that means then Jacob is really no longer to wrestle, able to wrestle the man, but we're, but we're told Jacob refuses to let go, and uh, the man wants uh, him to let him go and says, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. So he said to him, the man said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. So here we see the name Israel. Jacob is renamed Israel. And a renaming means uh, a new identity, a new way of life, a new character, and Jacob has striven with both God and with human beings, and he has prevailed. So this is the name of the nation Israel comes from the patriarch Israel. Now it's interesting, by the way, that even though the name is his name is changed to Israel, and the nation. Uh, that uh, descends from him will be called Israel. 
throughout the Old Testament, Jacob is mostly referred to as Jacob. Uh, you don't all of a sudden start seeing the name Israel. And that perhaps could be simply to distinguish between the people and the patriarchs. So we want to continue to, we don't want to be confused uh, at any time. Are you talking about Israel, the patriarch, or Israel, the nation? So the name of Jacob remains, even though he does have the other name of Israel. And um, so he blesses. Jacob there, think about this for a minute. Jacob gets a blessing from his father 20 years before, sort of finagled his father, deceived his father into a blessing. Now he gets a blessing because he refuses to let go. He continues to hang on and says, I'm not letting go until you bless me, until you offer me a blessing. Because even though up to this point, we're told that he's wrestling with a man, Jacob seems to realize this is more than a man. This is not just another human being. And Jacob actually then, when the wrestling match is over, refers to the place as Peniel, which means I have seen God face to face. So is he wrestling with the angel? Uh, often in the Old Testament, it's true that the, when we, we hear about the angel of the Lord, it's actually language we're saying the Lord. The angel of the Lord and the Lord are often identified, not all the time, but often identified uh, as synonymously. So. Do we have here again what I uh, when I when I talked about Abraham and the three visitors talked about it as a proto incarnational event? Incarnation is the word uh, that we use for the doctrine of God becoming flesh in Jesus Christ. Do we have here a a pre incarnational event, a glimpse of an incarnational event, a prefiguring? of God coming to us finally one day to live with us uh, in Jesus Christ. Uh, the text can read that way. And so, you know, Jacob recognizes that he's, uh, he's wrestling with the divine, and he has. He has spent his life wrestling with God uh, in good ways and not so good ways and also with other human beings, and yet he has prevailed. And so, uh, the story ends with this interesting little editorial comment that, that Jacob spent the rest of his life limping because of the, the, the man had touched him and put his hip out of joint. And therefore, verse 32 says, therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the thigh muscle that is on the hip socket because he struck Jacob on the hip socket at the thigh muscle. Now, when you read the law, there's absolute, the law of Moses, there's absolutely no prohibition about eating the... Uh, the meat that comes from the, the hip socket, but apparently there's a tradition, at least a tradition uh, for the earliest readers of this material, the earliest hearers of this material, that they didn't eat this piece of meat simply because as a reminder of the story. It's a, it's a tradition that's a reminder. It helps you remember who you are and what you're about. And we, we have the same kinds of things. We have certain traditions. Uh, that we do or do not, or things we avoid because it reminds us of who we are, whether that's as Christians or it reminds us of our family, our ancestors. So this is another editorial comment that helps to explain to the, the original hearers why they don't eat this piece of meat, this piece of muscle, uh, when an animal is consumed. Uh, so that's how that story ends. Now, uh, Again, what is this a story about? It's about reconciliation and, and uh, that, that Jacob reconciles with Esau, that uh, Jacob reconciles uh, in some ways with God here at the end uh, and has prevailed in, his, in, his in this reconciliation. All right, so, but reconciliation doesn't last forever, unfortunately, in the human context. So we get into chapter 34. And now Jacob and Leah's daughter, Dinah, who was mentioned a couple of chapters earlier, comes into the picture. Uh, she goes to visit, they're in the land of Canaan again, and then she goes to visit the women of the region. Uh, could be just uh, to get to know them or a visit. We don't know. We don't know the, the circumstances for why she does this. Uh, but a prince of the reason, a prince of the region, uh, named Shechem sees her and basically rapes her and forces forces her and uh, uh, 
but yet we're told after he forces himself upon her and rapes her that he's drawn to her and he loves her and so here he ha here he has violated her but in the midst of this now uh, has this sense that there that he means she means something more to him um boy uh uh this is this is tough this is uh, it's hard to it's hard to have any kind of sympathy for this guy to be honest and uh so jacob has heard that shechem in the language in verse five has defiled his daughter um and jacob doesn't tell his sons because he understandably understands that his sons will not be happy they hear their daughter or their sister uh, has been treated in this way and so he doesn't say anything um but uh shechem uh goes to see jacob and um he proposes to marry uh Jacob's daughter, whom he has violated, he has raped, but wants to also marry her. Now, Jacob's sons hear about this, and understandably, they're very angry. So, uh, to understand some of the dynamics here is remember Jacob is in 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 the land of his father and his grandfather, but he still uh, is at uh, um, a disadvantage in reference to wealth and in reference to power. Uh, He's he's in a, he's still in a sense has to be concerned about uh, those who have been there longer the Canaanites uh, who are there so he he needs to be careful for not only his survival but the survival of his own people and so Shechem uh, uh, offers this and also says uh, if you do this then you know our daughters can marry your daughters and your daughters can marry. Uh, your daughters can marry your our sons, and our our daughters can marry your sons, and and we'll all just live together, and and we'll trade together, and we'll grow crops together, and have herds together. The dilemma here for the Israelites is the issue of assimilation. So we, we go back to Esau and his Hittite wives. The dilemma always is with this: is do you assimilate? Do you do you engage in these kinds of uh, relationships in a way that you lose who you are you lose your identity you lose the identity of your clan you lose your religion uh, because the Canaanites don't worship the same God you do and do you eventually assimilate uh, and then you become unfaithful uh, and, and you lose who you are so um, this is uh, so so what happens is uh, the sons of Jacob as they're as they're dealing with Shechem um and and they actually deal uh, deceitfully with him because of what's happened to their sister they're angry and so uh you know we can't do this we can't do this as long as all oh, you canaanite males are uncircumcised because that's a sign of the covenant so he says you know if you all get circumcised then we can do this right now of course circumcision is just a sign of the covenant it, it doesn't it, it doesn't uh uh it's not the be-all and end-all of the covenant. Uh, there's more to being faithful to God than circumcision. So, but they, but they use this, they use this deceitfully. So uh, Shechem, who seems to think it's a good idea, says, okay. And so he orders all of the Canaanite men with him uh, to be uh, circumcised and if you're all, so that we all can live together happily ever after, I guess, is the idea. Um, but what uh, Shechem doesn't know is there's a plot going on with uh, uh, Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi. And so uh, on the third day, after all these Hittites have circumcised and they're sore, they're in pain. This is not, um, yeah, this is, this, is a, this is every guy's nightmare, so to speak. And so they're in pain, uh, probably no doubt struggling to, uh, to walk and certainly not run. And Simeon and Levi go into their camp and slaughter them all. And uh, said they took their swords and came against the city unawares and killed all the males. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the sword and took Dinah, 
out of Shechem's house. She's still a, she's still there. Is he she a captive there? Um, uh, we don't know. But take him out of the house and went away. And then something really chilling. And the other sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because their sister had been defiled. They took their flocks and their herds, their donkeys, and whatever was in the city and in the field, all their wealth, all their little ones and their wives, all that was in their houses they captured and made their prey. Did they turn and do to these Canaanite women what was done to their sister? Is that what happened? Have they proven to be uh, just as treacherous as as uh, Shechem? Um, hmm. This is this is this is chilling. And this, by the way, this is the first um, violent encounter between uh, Israelites and Canaanites, and this will figure in. Uh, there'll be more violence later on once we get to the book of Joshua. But, you know, one, one of the things that, that comes out of this is, again, just that women do not, uh, are not considered, uh, you know, you could say, we could say in today's language, I guess, that women are not considered to be fully human, even though Genesis tells us God creates male and female in God's image. Uh, women just uh, are not treated the same way. Here is, here is Dinah, uh, who uh, is in a no-win situation. She's violated, uh, no fault of her own. Uh, but then what kind of way of life is better for her? Is it better for her to go back to her tribe, to her community, where she will be viewed, she will have a stigma on her. Uh, she will be viewed, uh, she'll be viewed, uh, oh, uh, you know, suspiciously, uh, be, be viewed um, as, as a questionable woman of repute, even though she did nothing to deserve uh, what happened to her. She did nothing. Uh, she's completely a victim. Is it better for her to be viewed like that in her own community or to go to the guy? And be married to the guy who violated her. I mean, she's just in uh, just this is just a situation no human being uh, should have to endure, and yet she does. Uh, and this is a result of domination, as way back in Genesis, when God issues the curses after Adam and Eve do what they're not supposed to do, that um, the the Women will rule over men, and that's, this is a result of sin, not as a result of what God wants. Uh, so, so Dinah becomes, in, in the midst of this, Dinah becomes the loser. Now, you've got Jacob, after he finds out about this, he's very unhappy. Jacob's in a difficult situation, obviously, uh, with, with his, with uh, being, being the fact that he knows uh, he and his family and his clan are a minority situation in a strange land, even though he is like his father Isaac and his grandfather Jacob, he buys some land in Canaan, which is a prefigure, prefiguration in a way of what will happen when the Israelites later on cross the Jordan and enter the promised land. Uh, but he's not happy with what his sons have done because he's afraid um, that uh, trouble will be visited on him uh, and that the Canaanites uh, are numbers are greater, and so if they gather himself themselves against him and attack, the, the, the entire he and as well as his entire household and clan will be killed and destroyed, and his property will be plundered. Uh, but the chapter ends with a really good question, verse thirty-one. But they said, "Should our sister be treated like a whore?" And this is exactly uh, the break. The great question, the important question uh, that is asked. What we have in this section is lots of unanswered questions. Um, unanswered questions about Jacob and Esau, unanswered questions about uh, Jacob's brothers and what happens in Canaan. There's just a lot of moral ambiguity in this chapter that for us today in the 21st century, some of it is very morally disturbing. But again, I remind you that God always works within the context of the situation. 
and God is willing in the midst of the mess of humanity to still work in that mess in order to slowly but surely bring us out of that mess. And uh, that's a good thing, and that's important. So we leave this today, we leave this uh, this devotion with a lot of unanswered questions and perhaps some ponderments and some confusion and some frustrations at the way some of this is playing out. Um, you know, we we often uh, want we like we like the neat sanitized version of faithfulness and faith, uh, and. We struggle with the complexities and the brokenness and the sin of human history and struggle with the fact that God works in that way, but doesn't fix everything. Um, and we have to continue on with the story because we do believe God one day will make all things right. But God is doing it in God's time. And God will continue to work with the frailties and the foibles of human beings uh, as he continues to work with us in the same way. All right, friends, that's our devotional for today. We will pick up tomorrow uh, with session 12, Genesis 35 through 37. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, encounter the death of Isaac, and we're going to get more genealogy lots more genealogy, Esau's descendants and the clans of the kings of Edom, which is the nation that Esau founds. Uh, and then uh, we'll begin with chapter 37 with a young Joseph, and we'll begin to get the story uh, of Joseph. One more quick recommendation. I, I said this in a few videos ago, that when we encounter in Genesis, and boy, we're going to get to it in numbers in particular, all these names, all these genealogies that are tough to go through and tough to pronounce. One of the things I suggest you might do is instead of necessarily reading it, or maybe you might skim it, but then listen to it on audio. Uh, you can go to the Bible Gateway uh, website and get free audio. And I think you can pick one of several translations and listen to it, it being read. Let someone else pronounce the names and you just listen and take it in. That's just a suggestion. All right, folks, let's pray. Gracious God, thank you again for the gift of this day and this time in this new year. And uh, ask that your blessings will be upon us as we move through 2021. Help us to prosper in this new year and make this time of devotions. Uh, help us to understand more of what you're doing, uh, not only in scripture, but in our world today. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, friends, tomorrow, session 12, Genesis 35 through 37. See you then. Have a good one.